Okay, well, good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone. This is Anthony Keoli. I'm the regional director for the Alaska Region TTA Center uh, based here in Wasilla, Alaska. And uh, today we're going to be going over submitting the application 2014. Uh, this is an updated presentation. Uh, we did something similar uh, last year and we've added some new content. And uh, so I'll be, I'll be going into that. Just a quick overview of some of our BB Collaborate tools. Um, we're going to mainly be using the, the chat box. So if you've got questions, go ahead and paste them or, cop or type them into the chat box. And uh, we've got a, a moderator that's tracking those. And then at the end of the, of the presentation, uh, we'll go through some of those Q&A. Okay. So our, our team here with, with the Alaska Region TTA Center consists of myself, Anthony, Angela Camus, our training and technical assistance manager, and Charles Peel, our technology and e-outreach manager. Um, he's actually not moderating today, although you see, his, uh, see him online. We have another person that's standing in for him. And uh, if you have any issues, um, let us know, and our moderator will try to help you out. Um, so a little bit about the Alaska Region TTA Center. There's four TTA centers around the country. Um, we service the Alaska Region, uh, which is about um, 267 tribes and numerous tribal organizations. Our core services are training and technical assistance. And actually, we've been doing quite a few all the regions have been doing quite a few trainings recently. And uh, with the FOA deadline coming up soon, we'll be, we'll be doing a lot of technical assistance, uh, especially the pre-app ETA. So our website's anaalaska.org. And uh, our news is, most of our news is posted in our Google page, Google Plus page, which you can access from, from our website, anaalaska.org. And we encourage you to also go to the national ANA website um, I'll be going back to that or referencing that again later in the presentation. Uh, in particular, the resources at the National ANA website are, are extremely help helpful. So ANA promotes self-sufficiency for Native Americans by providing discretionary grant funding for community-based projects and training and technical assistance to eligible tribes and Native organizations. And ANA's vision is that Native communities are thriving. We've got several upcoming webinars uh, in the next month. On March 20th um, will be the three examples of excellent project planning, which will be hosted by the Pacific region. And then on March 27th, there's another ANA um, application submittal webinar that's going to go into more detail on looking at uh, application checklists and uh, putting all the pieces together just before submission. So that'll be definitely something that you'd want to uh, attend. And just a note, um, we are, ANA is still looking for reviewers and facilitators for panel review. Um, we encourage you to sign up for panel review. It's really a, it's an excellent opportunity to understand the grants process and what's required for, for strong competitive applications that lead to successful community-based projects. Um, we'll go ahead and paste that link in for you now for panel review. So the goals for today's webinar is to understand the requirements for filing an exemption from electronic submission. In other words, to get an exemption so that you can file a paper application. We'll, we'll go over that briefly, as well as a deadline. Um, we're going to review some help resources for DUNS, the DUNS number, 
uh, SAM and grants.gov, and then I'll be mentioning and, and showing you how to access the webinar that was just done on how to register for each of those. Um, grants.gov, we're going to focus mainly in grants.gov on how to, how to package and put together your, your proposal and where to put things within grants.gov. And then some tips on completing some of the forms, um, some of the do's and don'ts as you prepare that package. So that's the goal today. All right, so let's talk a little bit about requesting an exemption for uh, electronic applications. So first of all, you need to know that the, the deadline for that is basically the end of the month. It's, it's 14 calendar days uh, before the, the due date for the FOA. And um, the due date for the FOA is April 15th at 11.59 uh, Eastern Time, PM, for electronic submission. So to, to qualify for an exemption, Basically, you have to demonstrate that you have lack of internet access or internet connection and that you have limited com computer capacity to prevent the uploading of large documents. So one way to do that is to, is to do a speed test and show, I mean, a lot of our communities in Alaska, uh, the upload times is just very slow. Um, but basically, you can just explain that um, you don't have the adequate internet to, to be able to process through grants.gov. And if you're going to file this exemption, you need to send it. OK, Rita, um, if you, um, we can send you a PDF of the application. I see that you're getting off. We also have an 800 number. If uh, you could paste that in, uh, moderator. So I encourage you to call on the 800 number at least, Rita, so you can follow along. OK, so I'm, I apologize. Um, the, the email address to submit your electronic exemption request is uh, electronicappexemption at acf.hhs.gov. Uh, or you can send it in writing. But bear in mind that if you, if you send a written request, it has to be received. Um, you know, by the end of the month, before April 1st. And another useful uh, tidbit or tip is that the if you receive approval for the waiver, it's good for the federal fiscal year. So if you've already filed it with ACF and they've approved it, then uh, you can reference that uh, for a and Make sure that it's, that it's still valid. But so you don't have to file it every time you're going to submit a, a grant within a a or ACF. You just need to do it once for the federal fiscal year. And I'm just going to briefly go over a little bit of the, the FOA spells out in detail uh, some of the formatting guidelines. So you'll have to download the forms for paper submission if you're approved from uh, the website on the screen here. And uh, you need to reference section 4.2 of the FOA, the Funding Opportunity Announcement for guidelines. You can also request an application package. And, and how to do that is in section 4.1 of the FOA. And then just once again, the, the deadline to file your, your exemption is April 1st, um, or before April 1st. And if, if you're approved for uh, paper submission, those are actually, they have to be physically received by 4.30 PM Eastern Standard Time. And if you're not approved and you're submitting electronically, everything, all the applications have to be submitted, processed, validated uh, before or by 11.59 PM Eastern Standard Time. And we're going to we're going to talk briefly about that a little later on in the presentation about not waiting to the last minute because there's a few things that have to happen uh, once you hit the submit button that can create problems for you meeting the deadline.
Okay, so what do you have to have in place to, to actually apply for funding? Um, you need to have a DUNS number, you need to have your SAM account current, and you need to have your grants.gov account. You need to have access to that. And a current um, authorized organization representative uh, with current active passwords uh, functioning. So we actually just did a webinar on, on the process for registering. This was hosted by the Pacific Region. And like all the a and webinars, you can find the past webinar recording of that and view it by going to a &A's, uh, National Resource Library. And then what I did here is I did a, took a screenshot of the search function. And if you just type in submit application, it'll pull up the webinars. And eventually our webinar will show up too here on uh, how to submit an a and grant. And uh, this, this webinar that was done by Pacific it goes into detail on how to register to get your DUNS number, how to, how to then register with SAM using your DUNS number, and then uh, ultimately how to get registered in grants.gov. So I really encourage you to um, view that webinar. And then what we're also going to do is we're going we're gonna to copy and paste into the chat box now a link to the grants.gov presentation um, that you can reference after this webinar. And that, that, that does go into detail. It's, it's most of what the Pacific had presented. Uh, they actually had someone from grants.gov present that. So that will be a helpful resource for you. All right. So just, just uh, quickly, a refresher. Um, if you don't have your DUNS number, uh, it's important you start that now. And what, what a DUNS number is, is it's a unique identifier that's uh, location specific. Um, so actually, some organizations have more than one DUNS number, and it's based on where your office locations are. So uh, if you haven't gotten your DUNS number, that's like something you have to do immediately. Um, it can take a couple days. And here's the website www.dnb.com, and then there's a tab for Dunn's number. And then I also put up the help desk number. Uh, we've had we've we've called that number before, and I also called them before this webinar. And they also they also provided me a business registration team number that you can call uh, to walk you through the process that they don't usually advertise. Um, okay. So next. Assuming you had, you, you've got your DUNS number, um, you have to get current and registered in the system for award management. And some of you that have been in the grants business for a while, uh, we're probably familiar with the central contractor registry or registration system, the CCR. Um, so that's gone away, and the government has consolidated a lot of these procurement systems. And so now we're using SAM, system for award management. So you have to be current in here. This establishes your eBiz point of contact. And uh, it also pushes data uh, up to grants.gov. So these systems are all integrated and linked. And uh, there's a help desk phone there. And there's some really excellent demonstration videos on the SAM site that you can uh, watch. and. Um, the help desk website is if you're having problems. So that's a good good place to go if you need to get current in your SAM. And I just want to reiterate that you, your, your registration has to be current in SAM. And then lastly, um, as far as uh, systems, federal systems that you need to be current in, you also need to be registered in grants.gov. Now, I'm going to walk through the process for downloading the a and application, and I'm going to focus on the SEDS application. Um, you don't actually have to be logged in or a current user to download a copy of the application and the instructions, but you must be registered in grants.gov. And you have to have uh, a current 
authorized organization representative um, who will ultimately submit the application. Now, we'll talk more about that, but uh, we've had instances where the, the AOR wasn't current or the password was expired. And um, so we, we strongly encourage you to get with your AOR and make sure that he or she can get into grants.gov without any issues and that his or her password isn't about to expire. So before we actually go into how to download the application package and instructions, uh, we want to provide a few tips as far as uh, using grants.gov. And first of all, um, grants.gov requires that you have Adobe Reader to manipulate the form. The nice thing is that you, you download that PDF form and you can work on it on your desktop. You don't have to be logged into the internet to, to work on it. Uh, you will eventually have to log into the internet to submit. Um, the thing to know, though, is that the, the software, you have to, you, you should be cognizant of the, the version of Adobe Reader software that you're using. If you go to grants.gov, you can test, you can click, click on the, uh, the, the uh, website here and uh, test your software, um, or you can look at what they recommend um, for Adobe Reader. The other thing is to actually package your your um, application. As many of you know, you end up usually having lots of attachments and and individual files. And we'll we'll share with you some strategies for consolidating that and getting that into the grants.gov package. But ultimately, you're you're going to need the capability to convert Word documents and Excel files. Uh, over to the PDF. Um, there are third-party PDF conversion software tools out there, and some of the Office tools have the capability to save as a PDF. Um, however, grants.gov does not sanction or approve any uh, third-party PDF conversion software. And something else to keep in mind if if you're if you've downloaded the package and multiple people are working on it and you're passing it around uh, your office or your team and people have different versions of Adobe Reader, then uh, that can create problems. So ideally, it should be on one desktop computer, one person that's putting it all together. Um, using one, you know, the compatible version of, of Adobe and the PDF conversion software. And the reason why is when you get to the point of submitting, you want to avoid uh, potential validation issues. So mixing and matching your, your Adobe software can sometimes create uh, problems for you. Secondly, we all, a lot of you are using different types of web browsers, and actually for grants.gov, they recommend Internet Explorer 9. That's the only one that they certify. So, you know, if you're used to using Firefox or Chrome or Safari or some other ones, um, you probably should download Internet Explorer 9, which is uh, the one that's most compatible for at least the submission process um, and to avoid problems during that or minimize problems. So a tip on this, though, when people are cert like do a Google search to download Internet Explorer 9, you want to be very careful which ones you, you select to download the free version. You want to go straight to the source. Microsoft's, you know, Microsoft site, not a third-party site, because uh, you may be downloading malware and other uh, problems to your network. So if you're fortunate enough to have an IT department, have them help you download it. If not, just be 
be certain that you're downloading it from a, a bona fide uh, Microsoft site. And that, that also applies to the PDF software. All right, so those are a few tips on the software and web browsers. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to walk you through, you don't have to be logged in for the steps I'm going to show you right now, but, but walk you through how to get the actual grants.gov package and instructions. And then we'll be spending some time going through those. Okay, so for starters, you need to go to grants.gov and click on the Search Grants tab. And what I've done here is I've listed the CFDA um, Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance Numbers for the key program areas. And you'll notice, I actually didn't add seeds on here, but um, the CFDA number for SEDS and seeds is actually the same number. So when you search for 93.612, you're going to pull up a couple of FOAs for that. And also the same for the, the language uh, FOAs as well. When you type in 93.587 and search for that, you will see several language FOAs, the EMI, Esther Martinez Immersion now, and uh, Language Preservation and Maintenance. So just keep that in mind. But for the purposes of today, um, I'm using the SEDS as an example, 93.612. So type in 93.612 and then uh, hit the search. And what you'll get is uh, the two SEDS related FOAs. Um, you'll see there's the SEDS and the SEDS. And uh, I just remembered I have a pointer, so I'll start using that, sorry. <laughs> Um, so, depending on which program you're applying for, you would want to click on the appropriate link. So we would click on, in this case, for this example, the SEDS, and that would then pull up this uh, this page here in grants.gov, and it'll it's got several options for you. It's got a synopsis that describes the funding opportunity. Um, a version history, which sometimes uh, if there was an error, there might be a, a modified version that comes out. The full announcement, and then the one that you're interested in to put your materials together is the application package. So that's the one that we're going to um, click on. And then this the screen will come up. So in order to actually download, you will have to put in your email and confirm it again. And what this does for you is if there are any last minute changes, then you will receive notification of that. Um, so that's it's real beneficial for you. And anyway, it's required. So anyway, that's the purpose of this, so you can get updates. And then after you've typed in your, your email, now you can finally get to the download application package page. And you'll see that we have two different files here, uh, both of which are critical. The instruction app, the instructions, and then the application package. And I'm going to go into some detail on both of these. So be sure you download both of those because they are they're both important. And lastly, um, once you've downloaded it, you're going to want to save you know, the package, and of course you'll save the instruction file separately. Uh, here's the save button if you open up your grant application package. So now I'm going to go into what's in each of these two files. Um, and then provide some tips on both of them. So for starters, the application package is the one that you're going to actually actively be using to populate with your um, your budget data, your um, some of the required forms, and uh, ultimately that's what you're going to be saving, checking for errors, and then eventually submitting up through the internet to grants.gov, uh, which is 
uh, basically like basically like a post office that uh, ANA uses to then download the uh, end product. Um, so in the application package, the, the purpose is to submit, to package and submit your entire application. And there are also some uh, embedded forms that you will fill out right within that PDF. There's both mandatory forms, like the 424, 424A, uh, and, and the objective work plan is now in there, as well as uh, some of the assurances. However, not all of the forms are in that package. So that brings me to the application instructions. What's in this one is the a description of DUNS and, and the SAM requirements, getting registered in those. Uh, ACF systems issue issues policy instructions and and this is something you, you want to take a look at. Instructions for filling out the objective work plan form, the 424, the 424A, and the 424B, um, the project performance site location form, and then the disclosure of lobbying form, which is um, an optional one. It depends on whether, if you read it, whether you have to, uh, whether you are required to do that or not. You have to look at your individual case. And then, I put in quotations hidden forms, not really hidden, but um, you should know that there are two forms in this application instructions package that um, you might need. The certification of filing and payment of federal taxes form and regarding maintenance of effort. So those two are, are kind of a deep in the uh, application instructions uh, PDF, so if you're looking for them, they're, they're kind of buried in there a little bit. All right, so those are the two at a high level overview of uh, what's what's in both of these. So now there is one other quote unquote missing form. It's not really missing, but if you're if you applied last year, uh, you you might be looking for the the OMB improved project abstract form, and you're not going to find it in the package. Um, so it is a requirement though for for your, your application. And the FOA basically just describes what it consists of, but it doesn't prescribe a specific form for it. So it, it, it is a one page, single space, times in Roman, 12 point font. And then at the top of your abstract page is the project title, the applicant name, address, contact phone numbers, email, and your website if, if available. And then a, a summary of your project description. So there's, uh, you, you want to look at the FOA because there's some, uh, there's a description of what that description should be. Um, so you would want to reference that when you're when you're filling out the the project abstract. Okay, so there you go. Those are the each of the forms. So the grants.gov application package, again, is a, a PDF. And um, it's got uh, a compilation of forms, your 424, the budget forms, the attachment forms. And uh, you'll see there's, there's mandatory forms and optional forms. The mandatory forms are required to be filled out to successfully submit your grant application. The optional forms are used to provide additional support for the application. And they may or may not be required depending on specific the specific types of grant activity. So you need to reference the FOA to know whether your optional forms are required or not. So now I'm going to look at the mandatory forms briefly. And uh, this is all on the, the, the opening page of your grants.gov package. So just to run through them, you've got your 424, your grants.gov lobbying form, other attachments form, budget narrative attachment form, your objective work plan, budget information, 424A and the 424B, and then project performance site locations, and then your project narrative attachment form. Okay, so a couple of tips. The mandatory forms, they're filled out um, inside the grants.gov application package. 
some data is pre-populated and you want to fill out your 424 first so that the other forms auto-populate. Fields in yellow are mandatory and they must be filled in and error messages will pop up if, if, pop up if a mandatory field is not filled in. If it's not filled in, you might not be able to submit your application. And then, um, although grants.gov is, is working on supporting more and more special characters, uh, to the extent that you can avoid special characters, you will minimize problems. And I highly recommend that you avoid copying and pasting from Word into this grants.gov package, especially in the objective work plan. Okay, the three um, other attachments forms or upload forms that I want to focus in on now is the project narrative attachment form, the budget narrative attachment form, and the other attachments form. So basically what we have here is we have these three forms within grants.gov that are going to receive or you're going to upload uh, the bulk of your, your documents. And what we recommend is that for each of these, you create a single PDF file. And um, like, for instance, if you're, your other attachments form, if you have multiple appendices and supporting documents, you would want to consolidate those into a single PDF uh, and then upload that one PDF so that um, you would essentially have three, three separate PDF files that you're then inserting into the grants.gov package. So that's just a suggestion. It's, uh, there used to be a two-file requirement. Uh, I think that, that's been waived this year. So the way this is laid out now, it looks like three files is uh, the simplest way to go for you. A few recommendations. You want to limit your file names to 50 characters or less. Don't use the same name and don't have blank attachments. These can create validation problems. Uh, you want to use PDF, the PDF type, no encrypted or password protected files, and avoid special characters. And as far as naming, the FOA basically says that you should observe the file naming conventions required by grants.gov and, and that applicants should name their application files so that it, the content is easily defined. Uh, grants.gov, when I refer to that, it's not real specific as far as the, you know, specifically how to name it. So one possible way you might name your file is less than 50 characters, uh, a short name of your organization so it's identifiable, the name of the program you're applying for, SEDS or SEEDS or whatever. Some of you may be applying for multiple programs. Um, and then the, the name of the attachment. And that's just a suggestion. It's not uh, actually spelled out anywhere that that's how you have to name it. When we talk about uploading your, your project narrative, which we'll do here in a second, uh, a few formatting requirements. You have one inch margins required times new Roman 12 point font. And you need to double space your, your narrative, but there are a few things that are exempt from that double spacing your abstract, the assurances, the forms, your third-party agreements, a logic model if you're including that, uh, and other documentation in your line item budget or budget justification. The total uh, package should not be more than 150 pages. And uh, there's some things that are excluded from the page limit, like the required forms, the OMB standard forms and certifications, as well as the business plan. So just a strategy or a suggestion, you should be strategic with the attachments that you do provide. Um, be targeted with, I mean, some of your, your documents, um, like say, for instance, your strategic plan, you know, it could be a pretty lengthy document. You may want to just focus in on the key sections of that, business, of that strategic plan and uh, that's relevant to the application so that you don't bury the reviewers. And that's just a tip. 
Okay, so now let's talk about the three the three files that I mentioned earlier. We're going to start with the project narrative attachment form, and what what you would um, include or consolidate into this one single file for the project narrative is the table of contents, the objectives and need for assistance, um, outcomes expected, your project approach. So your your whole project description. Now the abstract. Uh, is not specifically stated anywhere that this is where you stick it. Uh, it. It could be a place where you put it, or you could put it in the other attachments form. It's up to you. Um, but for today, I just suggested that you include it here. So that's uh, this would all be combined, and then you would number the pages into a single PDF, and then you're going to upload it here using the add mandatory project narrative file. The second file is the budget narrative attachment form. And the only thing that's specifically required for this is your budget justification. So ANA doesn't prescribe a, you know, a specific, uh, it doesn't have a specific layout for that. Um, there is guidance, though, as to what that budget justification should include. And um, it should be a line item detail that includes detailed calculations for object class categories identified on the budget information standard form. And your calculations must include estimation methods, quantities, unit costs, and other, other similar quantitative detail sufficient for the calculation to be duplicated. OK, so that's the, the FOA verbiage. And um, a lot of times uh, what we see C is a a line item summary, budget summary, and then detailed a detailed explanation um, for each of those. Uh, and then your your line item summary typically shows the A and A, the federal request, and then the non-federal share request, column two, and then the total project budget. So, um, as far as your indirect cost rate and other supporting documents for your budget. These are not, uh, it's not spelled out that these go in here. You could you could possibly put them in with your budget or you could put them in the other attachments. Uh, that's up to you. And so lastly, well, you would use the, the budget narrative upload form with your single PDF of your budget justification, one file, and then the third one is the other attachments form. So this one is also, we recommend a single PDF. And this is all the other documentation required for your, your application, such as the governing body support or resolution, community representation, representation of board of directors, which um, is not required for federally recognized tribes, um, but for nonprofits. Proof of your nonprofit status if you're fi if you're submitting as a nonprofit, commitment of your non-federal sources, job descriptions, resumes, support letters, third-party agreements, and then those other the other two forms I mentioned that aren't already prepackaged in grants.gov, uh, the maintenance of effort, certification of filing, and any other supporting documents. And then I would suggest putting the business plan at the very tail end since the business plan doesn't count towards your page limit. So for this third file, you would also number number it as well. And then you would use the add mandatory other attachment to upload that to your grants.gov package. All right, so those are the three consolidated PDF files that we recommend. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through not every single form, but some of the things that have that have uh, been issues for or questions really for people that are filling out a couple of these, uh, particularly the 424. Um, so we'll start with that one, and uh, and then we'll wrap it up with some of the submission issues. All right. So the 424. Uh, a tip on this one is, uh, and I mentioned it before, you should always fill out the 424 first because it'll pre-populate information in some of the other forms. And the thing that we get this question a lot 
for budget purposes, many of you are doing a more than one year project. However, what you're going to actually put here is just your your year one budget numbers. Okay. So moving on to the 424A section A. Um, on this one, again, you're going to use your year one budget numbers. This would be your federal request, your non-federal request. I believe this one auto auto uh, calculates. Uh, your your CFDA number goes here, and uh, on column A here, you're going to put the name of the the grant that you're applying for. So it says in our example. Section B, this is uh, where you're going to describe your object class categories. And for this one, you're going to, again, start with your year one budget numbers for these object class categories. And the other thing that's unique about this is that this, is, this would be your total project costs um, that you're describing here. So your total project cost for personnel, for fringe, for travel, and so on. OK, section C, moving down the form. Um, now you start to describe your non-federal share. And uh, for here, this is going to be your cash match. So you would put your, for year one, your cash match for the applicant, which is probably the organization that's applying, you. And then uh, match, cash match, cash and income match from your other um, sources. So third parties that are part of your team or your partners. And, uh, and then the name of the grant program here. All right, so that's, this describes your non-federal share. And um, you, you will be required, whatever you put here, to actually, during the implementation, uh, comply with. So the government will hold you to whatever you are pledging as your non-federal share um, as a condition of the award. So be mindful of that. OK, a little bit more. Um, the forecast of cash needs, section D, what you're doing here is you're taking your um, federal share, your federal, the federal requirement first, so the year one ANA federal award, and you're going you're gonna to project your cash flow needs. So uh, ideally, you would, you would look at this uh, objectively and um, if you have, uh, if you anticipate some major startup costs in the first quarter, then you would then you would want to reflect that and have a larger amount of your budget, your cash flow documented there, and then and then spread out the remaining throughout the other three quarters. So um, this will actually be tracked, and so the more the, you know, the closer that it fits your projected reality, the better. Uh, rather than just dividing by four. And then section E. Now, this is the one thing we just want to point out here. It gets a little confusing. If you have a multi-year project, uh, you could have a, up to a three-year project for SEDs and the other FOAs. And then for Cs, you could have potentially up to five years. This is where you would put your future uh, federal funding needs based on your your budget justification that you put in your application for year two, which goes in this first column, and year three, which goes in this second C column, and then year four, and then year five. So just just be aware of that. Okay, now we're going to just talk briefly about the OWP. This is a required form, of course, and it's it's already prepackaged in the in the grants.gov PDF package. So you fill this out within that PDF. It's not something that you do outside of it and then load it in. A lot of you will will maybe you have a copy of the Word version of this. 
from the ANA website and you'll want to or you will try to uh, transfer it over. However, we highly recommend that you not copy and paste it into here, but that you literally type um, <clears throat> the form in. And a few things about the OWP for dates. You're going to want to use actual hard dates, month, day, and year, beginning and end. Excuse me. You you will you will have no more than three objectives, and so the way that you do this is you would you would list out for your year one your three up to your three objectives, uh, complete that. And then you would start a new year, and what what will happen is your some of the objective information will be uh, pre-populated into the new year, and then you'll update your activities in the subsequent years. So that's how this form works. Um, so those are a few tips on the OWP. As far as activities. Don't go overboard listing uh, 500 activities. You want enough activities and key milestones. You want them to be to you know to ensure that if you have a cost in your budget that you've accounted for it in your OWP, uh, and that they're con that it's congruent with your budget and it's congruent with your your the rest of your narrative. Sometimes people fill out the OWP first and then they end up tweaking and, and modifying the rest of their application and their OWP is then out of sync. So those are a few tips. Okay, so we have, um, we're getting to the submitting process stage here and we have a webinar coming up on the 27th um, that Western is doing that will go into more detail on the actual, uh, like, application checklist. So you're doing your final quality control and then you're taking a, a detailed application checklist and you're going through that and you're making sure that you've addressed everything in the FOA elements, the criteria, the evaluation criteria and the evaluation questions. Uh, you've got all your forms completed. So you're going to go through that, that checklist and you'll learn more about that in detail uh, on the March 27th webinar. So we recommend that you sign up for that. Um, we also suggest, as, as part of your quality control, um, to go to your TTA, your TTA provider for your respective region and request free review. We know, at least in the Alaska region last year, we had uh, a small number that didn't do that, that, that weren't, uh, as, that, that weren't uh, funded, and uh, we felt that it probably could have helped had they gone through that process. So few more tips for you. All right, so before you submit, going back to this, uh, the grants.gov package, a few of the key buttons here, um, the save, check package for errors, which you're going to want to do before you attempt to upload. And then uh, we said it early on, make sure that you have contact, that, that, well, that your AOR is current, uh, that, it, that his or her password's current, and um, so you don't have any surprises. Um, and unfortunately, we had a few of those surprises uh, last year or last last round. So um, so check your package for errors and then save and submit it so that you're prepared to, to upload it to grants.gov. And of course, at that point, you need to have a hopefully stable internet connection ready to, to roll. So the, the basic process is uh, once you've checked your application for errors and it's it's not found any, uh, your AOR AOR would then log in, name, password. Um, he or she would then sign and submit the application, and then uh, once that's done, then you would get a confirmation screen with the tracking number that you want to keep. And sometimes it's hard to print these things, so uh, you want to do a screenshot. Um, 
you want to keep very good records of this electronic submission process because you'll need those if there's a problem down the road. Now, once you've attempted to upload, your AOR has attempted to start the submission process, you need to be patient. Many of you have very slow internet, uh, especially here in rural or in rural Alaska. Uh, we have just incredibly slow internet. And the upload speed uh, for some of our communities, you know, it could take two hours uh, to actually upload. So don't hit the cancel button if it seems like it's uh, scrolling and, and loading indefinitely. If you're not certain, you need to call grants.gov first, call the help desk, and find out what's going on before you hit the cancel. It's just a suggestion. So be patient. Now, hopefully you'll, you'll get that confirmation. It'll, you'll be able to have uploaded it with no issues. Then the other thing with the AOR is that person's going to get three critical emails. Number one, that that uh, the application's been received. Woohoo! Okay, we're all you know we're celebrating. Sigh of relief. But you also need to watch for the validation email. And the, va the validation email is is important because if if for whatever reason your application there's an error detected, it basically will not accept the application and you have a short period, a short window of 24 to 48 hours to correct whatever the issues are. And that, at that point you may want to be on the phone with grants.gov and saying, what do I got to do to fix this? Um, okay. Lastly, once it's validated, you'll get a third email, which is the, the, the email saying that the agency has retrieved your, your package. And at that point, uh, you can go on vacation for a short while, I joke. <laughs> um, so just, just for your information, the um, help desk and phone for grants.gov is 1-800-518-4726. I know from personal experience that these guys are very helpful and uh, They've they've helped us on some issues. Uh, for instance, just as an example, you know, like if the security settings on your your PDF software are, are set such that it won't allow it to be uploaded, they'll help. They'll walk you through how to correct that. So these guys are they're uh, well, what we call Skookum in Alaska, which is they're they're awesome. Okay. Uh, this has come up recently. ACF has a policy now, and um, I'm quickly running out of time here, but for systems issues. So first of all, you you need to start your registration process uh, two weeks or sooner, really. I mean, it should be you know a month ahead at least, but for documentation purposes, you should have you should document that you started this process well before the deadline. and um, ACF defines, because they've had so many issues with this, a system issue as a technical problem with the federal, a federal system, not your personal systems, that prevent you from successfully getting your application validated by 11.59 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, which is the due date. So, you know, sometimes you can submit before the deadline, but you're, you're not actually validated until after that, and then, then you've, you're out of luck. So, the only reason, <coughs> or uh, what you need to do is, if you have problems, you need to you need to document and report it immediately, within 24 hours of the deadline, and um, keep a record of that in order to, um, you know, if, if for whatever reason the systems issues prevented you from applying timely. Okay, so. Um, You can download the systems issue policy, and I think we've got that link that maybe uh, the moderator can push out now. And uh, the moderator, if you could also push out the full link um, and then the reference links for this webinar, 
into the chat box at this time. So we, I will take uh, some questions and answers uh, for uh, a few minutes. We're kind of up on the deadline now. As far as the one hour, I apologize. I, I waited five minutes to um, to see if we could get some more people in. Um, so if you have to leave, uh, please fill out an evaluation form. Again, there's a follow-on session to this one um, that I mentioned earlier, and uh, that's going to that's going to go into the detailed application checklists. So what I'll do now is we'll I'll go ahead and put in the um, evaluation form and then we'll take a couple of, for those of you that can't stay on, we'll take a few Q&A and uh, hopefully I can answer and I would also, if I if I can't answer, uh, I see Richard Glass is on and I'm hoping that he can also help me out. So here's the evaluation form. And I think we have, I'm going to check, uh, the moderator was tracking a few of the Q&A. And I'll go through some of these. Okay, so we had a question about cash match. Your match, can it be in-kind support or non-cash? So your, the, uh, the matching requirements for your non-federal share can be cash or in-kind. And a lot of times we see a lot of in-kind matching. Uh, so an example of that would be documenting volunteer time that's that your volunteers are putting into your project. Um, I'm going to jump down to Candy's question about not copying and pasting from Word into the OWP. So just, you know, uh, a lot of applications, they have tried to insulate uh, and, and write the HTML or whatever code they're using so that it accepts uh, copy and pasting from Word, which is in a totally entirely different language. But a lot of times there's metadata that's, that's copied and pasted in that you can't see, and that metadata is what trips up the systems. So uh, really the, the safest bet is to type right within the OWP form and, and not, not uh, create problems for yourself. Maybe someday, uh, you know, that copy and paste will actually work. Um, so, all right, that's that one. And we there was two questions about the certification of filing for taxes and the maintenance of effort. And what I would what I would say is, please, uh, th those two are described um, in the in the application instructions. So I would refer you to that the application instructions for both of those forms and and what they're for and what you need to put in them. The question about a three-year strategic plan. Um, the only, uh, the three-year strategic plan would count towards your 150 page maximum page limit. The only thing that's exempted is the business plan. So any of your attachments, uh, except for the exemptions that I mentioned earlier, are subject to the page limit and the, um, except for the, the business plan, which is not. Single spacing tables inside the narrative. Uh, Rich, maybe you could uh, chime in on that one. I'm not sure about the tables in the narrative. Um, sh sure. I I don't believe, but I'm, I'd have to check right now to see if uh, there is anything specific in the FOA that, that, that answers that question. If there's not anything in the FOA that addresses that, then it's, then it's, not, it's not answered. So do whatever um, works with, with your application. I'll look right now to see if there's something that specifically talks about tables. Um, and if there is, I'll, I'll post a link. But if it's not, a, if it's not answered in the FOA, then it's, um, there's no answer that I can give uh, about it. Just um, understand it's not addressed. Thanks. Thank you, Rich.
Okay, so this is a last call for any other Q and A. Um, yeah, I, uh, the AOR login was a question. Um, that's the authorized organization representative. So I would refer you to the grants.gov presentation that uh, we gave you the link to, and that there's some really excellent. I mean, that that presentation is great. If you walk through it, it lays it out. Uh, simply, where it's easy to understand, you know what the roles are, and uh, so I take a look at that presentation, and it'll, it will explain clearly what the AOR is, the eBiz point of contact, and so on. Okay, last call for questions. Oh, thank you, thank you, Candy. So tables are exempt from double spacing for the FOA. And uh, thank you, Iris, for attending. All right, so please, uh, please fill out the um, the evaluation form. We we need that for um, you know to continue to improve our our presentations. And um, thank you for attending today. I wish everybody all the best. Reach out to your TTA providers. They're some of the best out there. Uh, they will. They will bend over backwards to do whatever they can to help, uh, you know, during your ETA. I know a lot of us work a lot of hours uh, trying to help make sure that we, the people, are, organizations are putting forth the best proposals possible that we hope will will lead to uh, successful projects and uh, achieve the mission of ANA, which is thriving native communities. So, Guyana Chaknuk from Wasola, Alaska, and. Uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. All right, thank you so much.